We thank you for joining us. This is your brother, Asar M. Hotep with the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology. And today is September the 16th, 2022. And we are going to discuss the etymology of Sekhmet, the name Sekhmet, the goddess in ancient Kemet and her relation to Ogun. And so we're going to critique an analysis of Dr. Sandro Capocici, uh, who essentially makes the argument that Sekhmet and her name uh, is a borrowing from the Semitic language and Semitic people. So we'll deal with all of that and more in just a second when we return. All right, peace. and blessings please and blessings it is your brother asar once again uh on this friday afternoon and uh, i hope you like the uh music i'm gonna change it up every now and then but uh you know play that little five minute block you know to allow people on the live uh to come up and show up and and not miss too much but want to, of course, shout out each and every one of you who have made yourselves known in the comments on YouTube. And first and foremost, want to say thank you to uh, Congo, uh, who started off today with a donation to the channel. And it is greatly appreciated. Much love and respect to you. And peace and blessings as well to Teti Ursa Ma'at Ra and Sanjeti Atta Kakra and Zombie. Brother Kofi Pasa TV is in the building. Musoni is in the building. Brother Jehuti Ma'at is in the building. And Edward Nigma 9 by 9 has made himself known and is in the building. So as more people uh, make themselves known, in the chat there's always more people watching in there make themselves known in the chat i will uh try to acknowledge you um and so i got two computers going on uh right now so to kind of help me navigate this uh but just to remind everyone a quick announcement that you know the text race and identity in ancient egypt volume one towards an etymology of the place named Kemet is in its first phase. And so we're going to begin the editing phase uh, pretty soon. And, you know, it is just going through some critiques in terms of the initial arguments and the like. And we'll be adding and subtracting, you know, normal kind of stuff you do when you are writing a text. So this is currently over 400 pages of critical analysis. And so uh, it, is, it is going to be a very, 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 very good text. And I can't wait for it to be in your hands. And as well, I like to uh, promote the text by our good brother.
the latest text from Dr. Chilima Lima Mukinge, uh, titled Muntu Wa and Zombie Portrait of Human as God's Special Creation. And it is available right now on Amazon. And I encourage each and every one of you to get this book. Uh, it is so many jewels in this mug. Uh, it is ridiculous. And I cite it myself all the time. And if you haven't gotten by now, uh, my latest text that came out in 2021, Chiluba Maweja Yurtaba Orisha in Ancient Egyptian Ak, an exploratory etymological study. This is also available on Amazon, or you can get it at my website at asarmhotep.com or maduandelapress.com. And so without further ado, we are going to get in. So this is going to be a kind of a uh, workshop lesson today. So I'm, I'm hoping that you have your uh, pen and paper uh, ready. And, and I'm going I'm to try to, once this is all said and done, to kind of divide and timestamp the videos so that, you know, it's easier to, to jump to particular sections as you know, this mug might be two hours long. So, you know, with that said, I just wanna kind of start off, you know, the part of the motivation for this particular conversation. And that is, you know, if you've been online, you know that there's always some debate about something. And when there are individuals who don't have a particular skill set to be able to properly judge an argument, what they do is defer to the quote unquote experts and what deferring to the quote unquote experts really is is just an appeal to authority and when 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 they do that they just admit that you know what i i don't have the skill set to to judge so i'm just going to go with a particular quote unquote expert that i like that supports my argument and they there there have been a number of folks online who have been doing this with uh the latest one they they try to do it with diop they try to do it with uh theophilo binga and now they're trying to do it with uh sandro capochichi an individual who i'm very familiar with and have had engagements with in in uh regarding certain arguments now this brother i believe he's from benin and he received a PhD in Paris uh, for linguistics and is currently working on or has gotten, I'm not sure uh, what stage he is in on this, but he's currently at Harvard uh, getting a PhD, a secondary PhD in art history, dealing specifically with art in Benin. And what, what people seem to do is think that any and everybody with a linguistics degree somehow becomes experts at historical comparative linguistics. So what I'm going to do at a later date is to do a show on linguistics, the field of linguistics itself, and to introduce to the public the different branches of linguistics and who all is involved in linguistics. Right. Because, you know, some people are confused about this. And so that's that's, you know, saying someone is uh, a, for example, you know, uh, an engineer. Right. And this person, of course, if you're an engineer, you have to study physics. But because someone is an engineer and they study physics, that this automatically makes them knowledgeable about quantum physics and or and or astrophysics. And that is just because there's physics in the name doesn't mean that, you know, you are able to uh, jump from from one area into the next and be competent in it. And this is what is missing from the dialogue of individuals who try to weaponize someone with a PhD in linguistics 
you know, against, for example, arguments that I or others make. And again, my background is science. So where we come from in, in the scientific village, demonstration beats conversation. It matters not what degree you have. If your argument is flawed, if the, the source material and the evidence doesn't support your argument, it's dead. It doesn't matter if you're world renowned in one area or even in the area that is being discussed. Your argument fails on its logic, the inner logic of it, as well as the um, the evidence to support your argument. Right. So <clears throat> we're going to show an example of that today. And the one of the main objectives for you as the listener is to not be intimidated by anyone with a degree in anything. If you are very interested in a particular topic or subject, it is upon you to study that subject and its methods so that you can understand what is going on. And if, you know, a number of years have gone by and you have, you know, studied the research methods, materials, as well as the historical arguments and evolution of the field, and you want to make an argument in that field, as long as you understand those particular principles and know the weaknesses and strengths of certain types of arguments, what schools of thought that certain people belong in, et cetera, et cetera, you can make those arguments. And because if, if you're one of those individuals who, who have not studied and have not gotten a PhD in it, but you studied and you take in formal or informal classes, for example, like I always bring this up because, you know, people try to weaponize people. Christopher Arid, uh, Joseph Greenberg, Theo Falabinga, and Shekanti Job. None of them have PhDs or masters in linguistics, but they did or do because Joseph Greenberg has passed away. Um, do, and of course, Shekhan Shope has passed away. They did or do historical linguistic work. But if the PhD or the masters were required in order to do it, then none of them would be qualified to have any kind of say so when it comes to linguistics. And that's just not the case. So I'm going to have to do a separate uh, video to to show you who all studies linguistics as part of their field. Right. It, it is a linguistics is a tool. And for historians, for example, like Christopher Eric, linguistics is a tool. For anthropologists like Joseph Greenberg, linguistics is a tool. For social anthropologists like Sheikh Ante Diop, linguistics is a tool. For historians like Theofalo Binga, linguistics is a tool. And for computer scientists like myself, linguistics is a tool. And so we, we study this and, you know, Years can go by and we become competent in it and then we can make arguments and we can recognize bad arguments uh, quite easily. And we're going to show a, a bad argument today. And so with that said, I'm going to share my screen. And so it's going to be big. So we'll hide that. And we're going to make this full screen at the moment and so we're just going to jump to the uh first slide so hopefully each and every one of y'all <laughs> to see this and so and make sure that you like and thumb up the video and shout out to sister tamika in the uh, chat 
and uh, you know we're gonna get this mug going and make sure that you share this video all right so <laughs> as discussed today's topic is the etymology of Sekhmet and her relation to Ogun now parts of this conversation has already been discussed in Aluja volume two which was published in 2020 uh, two and a half years ago and uh the and i want people to understand like the the recent conversations on sandro capochichi is is not the the origin of this analysis and so for those of you who have Aluja volume two in chapter 10 is where I discuss this subject. And in there, I critique Capo Chichi's essential argument there. So this is just a kind of a rehash for those who don't have the text and, and to add some, uh, some other connections that we've discussed in, in other areas. So, this is a photo of uh, Dr. Capochichi, Sandro Capochichi, and the he's written a number of texts, and I didn't include an online blog uh, about this subject that he also has, but he has uh, written in French, and I'll just translate on the origin of two Yoruba and Bay theonyms or uh, deity names to, to be exact. Um, that one didn't, at least the copy that I have doesn't have a date on it. And in the second one is a comparative essay on uh, a few or a number of deities or traditional deities of the Gulf of Benin of the ancient Nile Valley, right? That was published in 2008. And then in 2016, he published in English, so you can you can find this one online as well, towards a new interpretation of the myth of the destruction of mankind. And I will be citing primarily from that text uh, today. And so his central thesis in all three of these texts or or part of his major argument in all three of the texts is that the goddess Sekhmet was borrowed uh the name traveled to west africa and among the proto be speakers that uh that currently live in you know the benin southern nigeria area right uh they recognize this deity as Chakpata, and the K and the P sounds are, you know, it's a double articulated sound, so they're pronounced together or really fast because you really can't really pronounce them together, but it's Chakpata, right? And so we're going to get into uh, this. So the, the name Chakpata is uh, given in, in many different forms. So in, among the Ga in Ghana is Shikpon. Among the Yoruba is Shokpono. And of course, uh, in Dahomey and Benin, Sakpata. And so he, he reconstructs the name as Chakpata, right? And this deity is the god of smallpox right and all of the kind of diseases and we'll get into uh the the details of that a little later but what he does in his text is that he compares uh you know in terms of he's trying to you know argue for a common sound correspondence between the languages so you have ewe fon chui ga and guan and you know in the ancient egyptian language the word segment the goddess of disease 
is, you know, a kind of a paronym to this word serekemu, um, meaning a bat, which you can see the hieroglyphs at the top. And so these are the examples that he gives, but he only gives these two examples. And so, you know, what, one of the things that I, I should have mentioned at the beginning of this conversation is that uh, Sandro Capocici is what we call an Africanist. And he follows the Greenberg method of comparison. I mean, it's a, it's a mass comparison and it's based on sound similarity, like the forms have to look the same and, and have similar meanings. And it's never like I, I have yet to see in any of Sandro Capocici's work, him do any historical comparative analysis and where he is, he is establishing sound laws based on a series of non uh, accidental regular sound meaning correspondences and to to argue whether or not that you know this is a borrowing or not right like there's 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 a whole bunch of analysis missing here and i don't want to get too much into that um at this moment because that in of itself is a is a lesson is a is an entire video onto itself so <laughs> Who is Sekhmet? And you'll see while I have the the H uh, and M sound uh, bolded in red, uh, a little letter. So on the left-hand side, you see a representation in stone of the goddess Sekhmet, uh, who is a lioness, uh, who is represented with a lioness mask, as well as the sun disk on the top of her head, right? And according to basic wiki, in Egyptian mythology, Sekhmet, also spelled in these different variations, is a warrior goddess as well as a goddess of healing. She is depicted as a lioness. She was seen as the protector of the pharaohs and led them into warfare. So we're seeing two major characteristics of Sekhmet. One as a warrior goddess and then another one as a healer. Right. And we're going to see why these two characteristics are associated with her. Now, if if y'all know anything about Asar Hotep and his research, you will know that paronymy plays a big role in my historical analysis. And because, you know, I'm primary concern with culture and the motivation behind cultural creation and motifs and especially in the realm of kimoyo or african religions and what i've discovered as a result of my deep analysis of the language in other areas is that paronymy is paramount to understanding why these deities have these these multiple associations and some of them being in opposition to each other like a warrior is someone who kills and destroys. But a healer is someone who mends and puts together. And so how is she representative of both? Paramnemi is going to be important here. So uh, Richard Wilkinson in his book, The Complete Gods and Goddesses of Ancient Egypt, informs us that Sekhmet not only was associated with plagues. So, so we, have, we have a warrior goddess who's also a healer, but is also associated with plagues and diseases, right? Um, was associated with plagues, often called the messengers or the slaughterers of Sekhmet, but also had the power to ward off pestilence, right? So this is the healer aspect of it. So she can, she can be um, associated with disease and plagues, but she can also drive off plagues or ward off plagues. Remember that word. If you can, if you if you have a pen and paper or you have like an open like word document, jot down the words to drive off or to ward off. That's going to become important towards the end of this conversation. Right. So this is a warrior deity 
who is a healer um, and also associated with disease, uh, pestilence, and plagues, but can also, you know, drive them out, right? And so, you know, one of the major stories that is told of her comes from the New Kingdom and is titled The Myth of the Destruction of Humanity, right? And so in this text, humanity is essentially mocking Ra, mocking God, and because of his old age and frailty, right? And God decides or Ra decides to destroy humankind. So before, you know, the, the Bible emerges and God destroys mankind with a flood and, a, and only a remnant was to live, in ancient Egypt, you have the, the same type of story, except God doesn't kill off humanity with a, a flood. He kills them with a pestilence right a plague but of course a remnant survives uh as the the story you know unfolds but here's an aspect of the story here it says then the god said before his majesty let your eye pursue them smiting them according to your will these evil conspirators there is no eye better able to punish them for you let the eye go down in the shape of hathor and one of the things that you got to kind of understand is that <clears throat> in many in in many of the characteristics of the deities, they are really different forms of each other. So you know, Het Heru, Sekhmet, and Ra essentially are the same deity. And you know, when Ra wants to do some destruction, or Het Heru, I mean, excuse me, when Ra wants to do some destruction, he either transforms. Um, into Sekhmet or he sends Sekhmet if, if he's a different entity. And in this case, Sekhmet uh, turns into uh, Het Heru as the story goes, right? And, you know, only when there, you know, uh, God sees or Ra sees that, you know, Het Heru or Sekhmet is killing off too many humans, <laughs> And at this point, it's becoming uh, unjustifiable. So what he does is constructs a concoction of, of beer or some kind of alcohol and, and turns the river red so that she'll be drawn to it thinking that it's blood and drinks it, the Nile River that is, and becomes intoxicated. And she uh, discombobulated, forgets what she was going to do, right? And so, you know, that that story is an interesting story in of itself. And so I encourage everyone to see, uh, to, to kind of research and read upon it yourself. And maybe one day I can get uh, some folks on a panel and we can go through the, the, the primaries ourselves, right? But just to give you that kind of background. So Capo Chichi's argument. <laughs> so this is from his text towards a new interpretation of the myth of the destruction of mankind. So there, there's a lot to unfold in that text. Uh, but this, these sections, which I'm about to quote now, are the kind of the central arguments for what we're going to address today. Right. So. He says, historical and comparative linguistics may throw an unexpected light on the understanding of myths. A case in point, as I will show below, is Sekhmet, the name of a deity, the name of the deity Sekhmet. I, uh, excuse me, uh, I'm reading this all wrong. A case in point, as I will show below, is Sekhmet, the name of a deity Sekhmet. Sekhmet is one of the main characters in the myth of the destruction of mankind. Its name is often analyzed as a substantive synchronically related to Sekhem, to be powerful, to extend one's power over someone, with the adding of the suffix T, marking feminine substantives, a process which would have resulted in the noun Sekhmet, the powerful one. This analysis appears well-grounded and quite satisfactory. 
However, one can still wonder why the deity chosen by the ancient Egyptians to symbolize epidemics was a female character. And we'll get into why that is the case and why it's important to really kind of study the language. One may also wonder why ancient Egyptians would have chosen to name it the powerful one. First of all, it is important to note that the word septim has yet to find a satisfying parallel in related Afro-Asiatic linguistic domain. So, you know, here's, here's further evidence of what I mean by that he is an Africanist because he's going with the whole Afro-Asiatic and that paradigm and anyone who deals with Afro-Asiatic is a mass comparator and, and doesn't know how to do historical comparative linguistics. They don't do the comparative method in, uh, in Africanist uh, studies, right? So this, this, this plays an important role on, on how he was able to miss what we're going to discuss today or discover today. At the present state of our research, the most convincing parallels for the Egyptian Sechem would be the Semitic root Zechem. The latter is documented by the Arabic words Zahama, to push someone away with a violent blow, Oran Arabic, Zahim, Zahim, force, violence, and Aramaic, Zahum, strong, capable, Racham, brave, capable, Zahma, strong vir and uh, vigorous. However, as pointed out by Takax, and that's, uh, I believe he has passed away, uh, the late Dr. Gaber Takax, the correspondence between Egyptian S and Proto-Semitic Z or Z is not regular. This Semitic, which I don't know how he would know since Takax doesn't do, uh, he doesn't use a comparative method either. And, you know, I, I get into it with Dr. Shamar Kato about this, but, you know, because he doesn't know. Uh, but, you know, this, this is why you can't trust, you know, the, the literature uh, when it comes to Afro-Asiatic uh, so-called comparative studies. This Semitic root, Zechim, would be even more unlikely to be a genetic con uh, cognate with Egyptian Zechim as the former would be genetically related to Egyptian Zechim to be nasty impetus, the latter comparison being based on regular sound correspondences. I doubt it. Another argument supporting the hypothesis of the Semitic root Zechem as the source of the Egyptian Sechem in Sechmet is the following. There exists in Egyptian another word, Sechem, meaning sister. It would be well related to the Arabic noun Zachmat, plectrum, stick used to, uh, I guess there's supposed to be a two in there, uh, used to pour. Uh, I don't know, this, this is an error in the, in the grammar here. Stick used, pour to beat the strings, um, or stick used to beat the strings, or for the use of the beat the string. I don't know what he's trying to say there. Or the chords of a music instrument or its drums, which is stemming from the same semantic root, Zechem. The fact that the only two words known so far to illustrate the correspondence, Egyptian S and semantic Z, are quite semantically distinct force versus music instrument, yet belong to the same root, seems to strengthen the possibility of borrowing. So the possibility of borrowing from who? From the Egyptian to the Semitic or the Semitic to the Egyptian? He doesn't say. And so he continues uh, to, he continues and, and says the following. He says, in Arabic, the root and normally I don't like to read these large paragraphs, but you kind of got to understand it. So, um, in Arabic, the root zechim is the synchronic source of the verb zahama, which means both to push someone away with a violent blow and to stench, said of spoiled meat. And that's his source there. The former meaning of the verb may be compared with Egyptian zechim, uh, be powerful to extend one's power over someone, but the latter. And, and, you know, uh, I guess I guess somebody tried to translate. I, I'm assuming he wrote this originally in French and then someone tried to translate it 
and just didn't get some it says but the latter but not the latter i see um however a noun derived from the latter zahamat means that means that stinks set of spoiled meat as pointed out above there is evidence of sekhmet's priests being associated with the inspection of meat freshness since the old kingdom meat especially that of wild animals for which the draining of blood is particularly important in order to prevent meat in, uh, infection legitimates in my opinion a comparison between the egyptian theonym segment and the arabic noun zahamat that stinks said of spoiled meat proto-egyptian may well have borrowed from a semitic language a root zeh from which would be borrowed the words zechem to act violently and zechemet stinking smell of spoiled meat after these words would have entered the egyptian lexicon they would have been re rendered as sechem and sechmet one may posit that in a in a context of hunting or a religious sacrifice because of the importance of meat it's spoiling which would have been a source of intoxication and epidemics would have been considered as a calamity for the society it would have occurred in similarly to several natural phenomena remaining opaque to the understanding of man and then it goes on um, into some other areas but what's important here is that one he he makes the hypothesis that it was borrowed from uh semitic and then he just he puts a starry form zek next to uh this word and then um assumes that is a root so for for uh capo chichi zek which we we would translate for the egyptian the 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 z or s sound uh, and then lowercase x uh, is the root. So he's saying that is the root, and then M is an extension. And we're just going to find out exactly why and how wrong he is. Uh, one, because he does not do any kind of internal analysis of Egyptian, and he doesn't do the comparative method, and which is the, the reason why he gets a lot of these things wrong and I've, I've kind of noticed this over the years like capo chichi has a habit of assuming a lot and making arguments from his unsupported hypotheses and and that's very problematic because you know in linguistics linguistics is like mathematics and you have to show your work again demonstration beats conversation so when we're doing etymological work so he's attempting to do an etymology here he wants to know the origin of the word sekhmet the name of the goddess and he posits that it is borrowed more than likely borrowed from the semitic languages in the fourth millennium bce and that you know it had an original meaning of to to stink or whatnot um and there seems to be some parallel with the powerful one or the power and things of that nature but there's there's when you're doing etymological work as i have you know shown this slide many times you know I always have to do a reminder that there's six fundamental areas of etymology that you have to go through in order to do good etymological work and thomas critch in his his essay etymology in the text a continuum companion to historical linguistics states the following the big difference between socrates's approach and modern etymology is that nowadays one tries to argue systematically in all strata in phonology in morphology and in semantics pragmatics and also extra linguistically in philology and in culture one also takes into account historical developments if one wants to be a productive and successful expert in etymology, one has to thoroughly study all the areas mentioned. And I try to go through all six areas every time I'm looking at a word and for which I'm trying to trace its origin. And this is just the, the same thing simplified here, right? And so uh, he continues in the conversation. Does he continue? Does he say this before? No, this so on the next page he continues the conversation and reminds us that for example in the 19th century and the 20th centuries uh starting with jacob grimm franz bonk and rasmus rask 
the comparative method based on strict morphological, phonological, and lexical comparison was developed. The most important output of this research was the discovery of sound laws, which mediate between cognate languages, their respective older stages, and their common predecessors. This research turn, in turn relies on good etymologies of words that exemplify the sound laws and the regularities of word formation. So this, this notion, um, like there, there's a strong connection between etymology and establishing regular sound meaning correspondences. And what Capocici didn't do in his text was to do any serious comparison between words to even know if, uh, if Zechem was a borrowing um, or was inherited by both of the languages. And without doing that step, you, you can't even propose an etymology. And so, like, one of the things I'm a stickler on is the research methods. And I always give y'all the methods and, and the sources where you can expand your knowledge on how to do proper research methods in linguistics and Africana studies. So we're going to get into now the etymology, the true etymology of the word segment, right? And so one of the things that, you know, nullifies his argument is that, you know, again, because he is an Africanist and, and an Africanist is just a label for those who adhere to the Greenberg and mass comparative methods um, and, you know, who, and there's other meanings when it, when it's just coming to, for example, an Africanist in, in, in history or whatnot. But when it comes to a linguist, when we say an Africanist, these are people who study African languages, but they, they strictly adhere to the Greenberg methods and, and they don't use it. They don't practice the historical comparative method, which is the scientific method used by linguists around the world to, uh, to demonstrate the genetic relationship between languages and uh, to reconstruct language families and to uh, do etymological work that we're dis uh, discussing here today, right? So the one of my discoveries is that the ancient Egyptian language essentially is a monosyllabic language. And it is based, it is built off of these consonant vowel roots, right? And so they either be consonant vowel or consonant vowel consonant or consonant vowel consonant vowel, right? And so these are kind of the two uh, uh, areas in which you can kind of describe a monosyllabic root, either consonant vowel, consonant vowel, consonant, consonant vowel, consonant vowel, you know, can be really considered a, a disyllabic root. Uh, so consonant vowel, then consonant vowel, consonant. And so, but for us, it is these consonant vowel roots. And in, in the Egyptian language, this, for example, the, the root I have bolded and in blue for all of you to see, right? And it is the, what we would transliterate as lowercase x when we're doing a manual decoldage transliteration system to be um, produced on computer screens or in typing. And so it's this word that you see here, het, fire, flame, ketit, fiery one. Raket, flame, fire. Anket, or really satsanket, fire, right? And you know that the T in the original word here is a suffix, because when we remove the T, you see that there's this other prefix here, and it's a different suffix here. So this, this sign here, we're going to pronounce for now Z a D Z sound or a T S sound in, in terms of the voiceless variation. So Z D Z or T S 
And there's historical precedents for why that more than likely is the uh, pronunciation of this sound. Um, so it's ket wu, burning one, set ket, a brazier. And a brazier is kind of like a portable heater, a portable stove, right? And then set ki, to burn, to evaporate. So there's a suffix with the verbal e. Uh, and then this one on the first one, when it says burning one, that is because it is suffixed uh, with the masculine uh, agent suffix, right? And so when we go down to this bottom layer here, we see that same root now suffix with the nasalized of Ular trio and suffix with a T. And this is the T for abstracts. So we have disease and illness. And then we have this, this Y here, which is another agent suffix, um, a sick man, a masculine agent suffix. And then we have another variant here from this same root that we see in this column um, suffix with a W, but it's not the same W. So this W represents uh, the suffix of abstracts. And so this W that you see here at the top where my mouse is, is an agent masculine is, is equivalent to Mu in Bantu, like when you say Muntu. Um, and, and this one is a different W. And so it's important to know these this aspect of the egyptian language because remember that capo chichi argued that it was a borrowing from some semitic and he was talking about a zik root and then an m was added um for that and so what i want to introduce here is uh you know and i haven't really kind of I've read enough of his work where, uh, you know, it, it's clear that he doesn't have a strong background in semantics either. And so we got to know how these these different words and stuff are formed and the derived meanings of terms as well as the semantic matrix that surrounds a given term. Right. So what you're seeing on the screen is a uh, an excerpt from the PhD dissertation by Dr. Bernice V. Hecker. And it is titled The Bi-Radical Origin of Semitic Roots. Now, for those of you who are vaguely familiar or don't know about Semitic languages, Semitic languages or Semitic words, the vast majority of them are are words that have a consonant skeleton of three consonants in sequence. And the changing of the vowels changes the meaning or the underlying nuance of a word. And that triconsonantal root can be prefixed and suffixed, as we'll see in, um, in just a second. But and so this has caused a, a, a lot of headache for Afrikaners linguists because of their mass comparison method. They can't find in the other African languages this, this dominant feature of the language of the triconsonantal roots. So it makes it hard for them to try to reconstruct further than proto-Semitic with other African languages, the so-called Afro-Asiatic languages, right? And, but as a result of that process, they come to discover that in reality, at some stage prior to Proto-Semitic, the roots of Semitic were actually bi-radical, two consonants in sequence, and that the third consonant was in fact had a grammatical function that later became fossilized, which forced the vowels to take on a new role. 
in in the uh, the diversification of the meanings of the terms, right? So I bring this up here because, for example, this this root here, what uh, Doctor Heckler is saying, is that there is in Semitic an HM root, right? That means hot or inflamed. And it is the root to the following uh, Arabic word, I mean, excuse me, Semitic words. So in Hebrew, ham, meaning all of these mean hot and flame, right? Or hot. Arabic ham. So this is where people think that, that, that the ham and hamedic means um, those are hot or who, you know, or, or people are burnt or black or whatnot. In Ugaretic, hum, in Akkadian, imemu, because the, the H type sounds uh, are are dropped in Akkadian. In Aramaic, hachmam, or hachmam, and she notes here that this denotes a voiceless velar fricative, right? And so, but from this biconsonantal root comes these words, and she gives a lot more examples in the other languages. And she, uh, but I, I, I've just chosen Arabic and Hebrew for simplification for our purposes. So in the Arabic language, that word Hamas means zeal, but Hamam with an extra M means spa or hot bath. Hamasha means enraged, to infuriate. So it's easy to see how from hot and inflamed, you know, with uh, can become enraged and infuriate. Then we have huma, fever, and then hume, red, bloody, excited. Humam, lava, embers. Tahamus, fanaticism. Because remember that word hamas, meaning zeal, then tahamus, fanaticism, like you just extra, extra with it. Hamaza, burn the tongue while tasting. And then in Hebrew, we have chamed, desire, the chamar, become inflamed, agitated, chamas, be ruthless, yachim, be hot with anger or desire, conceive, and the chamas, to do violence and injury. So you can see how from this, this basic root, this two consonant root, when another consonant is added and there's changing of vowels, we get an expanded semantic field that ranges from a hot bath to someone being zealous to infuriation and rage and violence, right? All from this notion of, of hot. Now, I bring this up because this is important for Egyptian because Egyptian has the same thing. So remember our root chet, meaning fire and uh, uh, burn on the body. When the T suffix is removed and it is replaced by M, we have the word warm, dry and hot. But notice when we add that Z or t sound, that same root becomes demolished buildings to dig up the earth, to harm someone, to debar, to exclude, to attack the enemy. Right. And then we have the the row under it mean and then we add a W to it. It means to demolish buildings. And so and then we have another a variation of the word, except this W is different. Because you have verbal W's suffixes and then you also have this w here meaning a stone breaker a demolition worker so this is that agent suffix so now we replace the w with a t suffix and it becomes the t of abstracts and it becomes ruins abandoned area piece of land right because this is a t for abstracts and for place places Right, it's the same T that is in the word Kemet that everyone's debating, right? And then we have Chemiet. This is the feminine, female evil entity, demoness, destroyer. 
all of these variations derive from this root here, which ultimately in the in the very far ancient, you know, mother tongue was a monosyllabic root, meaning um, the sound of dry wood being cut or a branch or stick. And then from this idea of rubbing two sticks together and causing a fire. And that's what this this is why this word het in Egyptian means fire burn. And it also means stick. And so any one of you can verify this using any basic ancient Egyptian dictionary. Het is fire burn. And het is also a stick, a tree. Because there, there's a semantic connection between wood and fire. And so from, from wood, then firewood and fire. And then from all of that derives these variations. And so this is important. And so one of the one of the reasons I want to bring this up <laughs> is because there is a this is why semantics is an important study as well. And not just just grabbing things from uh, random dictionaries. You got to you got to study the people. You got to know the psychology of the people and and how they map words together. And so this is a a table this part of a table that i that is in a new book that i'm uh, uh currently writing on race and identity in ancient egypt and so uh what i want y'all to do is focus on this gray uh area here where we have this word smith to turn sour to spoil to go bad and then we have in um this other dialect of Egyptian, Sakim Kim, destruction, Gim Gim, to crush, smash, to tear, right? And then in the Chiluba language, we have a, its cognate meaning, Nyanga, which was Nganga, um, and the, the G sound was palatalized. Uh, <clears throat> and it means damage, destroy deteriorate also spoil defile mess up abuse maltreat so what i want y'all to see here is that there is a correlation between damage destruction and spoiling and so this is not and and this is why this is important for these cognates here so what egyptian did is they split up the meanings so in, you know, this word here became the sole word for to turn sour, spoil, to go bad. But Kim Kim and Gim Gim just kept on the destruction aspect of the word. But they're still all the meanings are still kept together in Chiluba. Right. And so in in this variation of a different table that we're dealing with. Again, pay attention to the gray area here and so we have this word in egyptian bed to destroy uh to hack up and then which is in the yoruba language baje or baje meaning destroy and then rot spoil so y'all see the connection between rotting spoiling and destruction and so the underlying theme is destruction and deterioration. The, the ancients viewed the spoiling of things as a deterioration of, you know, some food or anything to this nature. So this is important because, again, the ancient Egyptian language is it has all of the these variations built into the language and especially with that him root which shows that it, you know it is not a borrowing they didn't have to borrow this idea from the semites it's already built into the language right and so you know we got to understand that you know these these triliterals or or, or tri radicals in egyptian aren't tri-radicals you know these these names for deities and the things they're built off a certain root so this is just an example here so i have a uh, huiti meaning shimmering light shining light and with the j 
prefix, we have the name, the famous name, Jehuti, the god Jehuti. And, you know, for those of you that don't know, besides being, you know, associated with, with knowledge, consciousness, and uh, mathematics and the like, right, in science, he's also associated with the moon. And this is what you see on top of his head here which is the sun disk on kind of a crescent moon, right? So this is really kind of the moon that you're seeing here on top of his head. And this is going to be very important because this name is a variant of the same root that gives us Sekhmet, right? And so by that same understanding, and understanding that, you know, the 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 triconsonantal root is not a triconsonantal root. And so even if you define segment as the powerful one, you already have a root in the the Egyptian language, him, meaning to force open. And then sahem to be terrible of, possessed of. And for those of you who you know, are familiar with that one story that we mentioned, the destruction of mankind, you can see why, as a result of paranimi, why this this word, this woman, this uh, uh, was chosen for that particular narrative because of, of her destructive capabilities and force and power. But notice as well, what's on top of her head? The sun disk, fire, she's associated with fire. And fire, the, let me go back some. So when we go here, when we talk about fire, the effect of fire is consumption, deterioration, destruction. So it's not destruction simply from just force, like, like somebody has, uh, you know, a bulldozer or a bat or something is going around physically destroying like that. It's the consummation of destruction from fire. The consuming and the disappearance of things that have been burnt, like a house or something to that nature, right? And, and so this is how her name comes to be from that monosyllabic root. The M is a suffix. But it's a monosyllabic root, this k sound here. And so as is, is evident by her, her depiction here, she's associated with fire and heat, and which is seen in these variations of the word here. So him, heat up, make warm, from him, hot, warm, dry. And the variant is shim heat to be hot to become hot and so this h and the sh sound interchange in egyptian and in chiluba we have kama drying evaporating kamakana dry dry through from kim to be dry so you see this him here it also means to be dry right meaning they're coming from the same roots here and in your language in the Ijebu dialect you have oguna red hot charcoal from fire right the, from a burning process and this ogun as is hopefully y'all can y'all can start to see where we're going to be going with this discussion in ogun right and so there's a semantic evolution coming from fire burn and flame and so in one semantic path we have to consume to destroy ruin to decay chaos violence and then from there it goes to violence of roariness storms war and disease in another direction you have light sun to shine also volcanoes and metallurgy and actually metallurgy could um well no nah, because this one's more in in from the fire aspect right instead of the destructive aspect so this stays here and then, but though from the concept of light, intelligence, knowledge, wisdom, and skills. So, you know, you got to understand semantics and semantic evolution, uh, metaphoric extensions, and the like.
right? So, um, and so now this is going to be important because when it comes to the semantics in African languages, for for Africans, anything dealing with pain or disease is looked at as being hot. Whereas anything having to do with health is associated with coolness, right? And so we'll look at some examples. Here's an old uh, friend and uh, colleague, Dr. Rhonda M. Gonzalez. Uh, she wrote a, she's a linguist. She's also an Africanist. She uh, studied and I think uh, Christopher Eric was her PhD advisor. Uh, same thing for uh, one of my direct teachers, uh, Dr. Carolyn uh, uh, Kleiman. And um, Karen, Karen, I say Carolyn. Well, I don't know if Karen is a short for, but Dr. Karen Kleiman. I don't know if her full name is Carolyn, but it's Dr. Karen Kleiman. And uh, and so she's she's one who kind of introduced me into this method at uh, U of H. But this person who I have on the screen, she used to teach at UTSA in San Antonio. So um, been to many of conferences uh, with her uh, and and the like. So, but this this text here, societies, religion, and history, uh, Central East Tanzania and the world they created 200 BCE to 1800 CE, right? And in her text, uh, in note 32, she states uh, this, we're dealing with this word lungu, right? And so we have the story form. So this is the reconstructed meaning, potentially evil spirit type associated with abandoned hot areas so an evil spirit associated with abandoned hot areas and so she gives a few examples uh coming from uh east africa for the most part and uh so the proto kash uh kaskazi uh and she goes nyanja kutena malungu have a fever meaning to be hot as the body right and then another phrase, Nafalelo Malungu, I have no good today. Uh, and, and meaning kind of like no energy, I'm, I'm, I'm hot, I'm sick. So with, with, it's, it's kind of a phrase meaning I'm sick, meaning I have no go today, right? Um, I have no ngolo, as we say in Kikongo. I have no energy because of uh, my health today. And then Kungwa Malungu. Be dazed and undone. Then ku kulu kuluku. I said it all wrong. Ku kulu luka malunga or ku guka malunga. Lose all power of mind and body from surprise, fear, or illness. Right? And then in Chiluba, we have uh, the words for poison, lunga or mulungu. Right? And then we have an ikirungu or runga, the same uh, root becomes the word for volcano, place of heat. And then mulungu, devil, mulungu, devil, right? And for those who wondering where I get this idea that Ra is a volcano, not that Ra is a volcano, that the cognates for Ra also are the same words for volcanoes. And so uh, one of the cognates for Ra in Central Africa is Lungu, dealing with heat and, and fire. Uh, and it becomes the words for sun, like in uh, Isizulu, Ilanga, sun, right? Itangwa. But that's a different conversation for a different day. So you see this illness and disease has to deal with heat, fire. Right. And if you know anything about Kalunga in uh, the among the Bakongo, and if you, you read Dr. Fukial's work, you know that Kalunga, Ka being the prefix, Lunga being a root meaning a fire force. 
right? So let's go to the opposite. And so in this text by John M. Johnson in Goma, Discourses of Healing in Central and Southern Africa, he says that health is identified by numerous metaphors, including balance. Now, this is the same word, lunga, is, is cognate for ma'at. So you say uh, malunga, mulunga, but lunga in both Zulu and Congo, uh, purity, vidila in Congo, and coolness, whose most widespread cognate is pod, to become cool or cool down, to become well and healthy. And just showing you that there's a there's a connection again between health and uh, and coolness. And the same thing with disease and heat. So hopefully you can understand why the root of fire and to be aflamed in ancient Egyptian becomes the root for destruction, you know, and destructive power in the word Sekhmet and why she's also dealing with healing. And uh, not healing well uh, with disease. But we'll get to why the healing where the healing comes in via paranomy a little later but you can see how this 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 comes about right and so this we even see the semantics in egyptian with the word sanet to be healthy to become healthy heal health right and then we have this variant of the word here sanebeb meaning cool right and you see the fan as the determinative here so uh, I'm gonna pause here for a second, and uh, so we can take a kind of a three-minute break, and we will be right back. So I'll get a you can stretch a little bit, and uh, we'll be back in about three to four minutes. All right. get something to drink because you know talking for a uh, long time 
makes your mouth feel uh, kind of funny. So uh, I have me some Wawa green tea. I know it ain't like real green tea. At least how I would, how I would make it, but it'll have to do for now. Anyway, we are back and we shall commence with our discussion. So what I'm going to show right now is that there one of the reasons why we know that Sekhmet's name is homegrown is because there are different variations of the same name. And the some of the variations become titles or secondary names for other deities, right? And one of them is Seth, uh, the deity Seth, that is, who is also a deity representing uh, destruction, evil, and all other kinds of, of different things. And we'll see that that is the case because of, again, paranemy. So let's continue. So before I, I get into that, I just want to put on the screen here uh, evidence of the uh, interchange of the M and the W in the ancient Egyptian language. So, you know, when I'm doing linguistic work and I see a variant of M, I always look for a B sound or a W in a related uh, word. I look for a variant with those sounds. And, you know, because experience has taught me that, you know, a number of these sounds interchange and, you know, which is kind of evidence of either allophones and or the, the existence of different dialects and or languages in ancient Kemet. And so this is just for that. So just know that the M and the W sound interchange, which is going to be important, as well as the I or J and W. So I, uh, in the English transliteration system, they use I, and in the German transliteration system, they use the J. Uh, graphene, right? Uh, but those interchange as well, and you can see these examples here as as evidence of those interchange and i also put a uh a, a whammy in the in the third example because the first example i mean the third example in the in the first column the the sound isn't w it's actually m right and then in the second column we have the uh the j sound right and or the or the I or Y, however you wanna you wanna use it, and and actually, <laughs> actually these should be switched um, in terms of the the actual rows uh, given the top, but you know that's neither here nor there. But but it it's still uh, it's still pertinent because of course M interchanges with W, so it's it's no. You know, it probably was a W at first, it's probably, but in the presence of the N, the W probably assimilated to N and became M. That's a possibility, but just putting that on you. So just know that the, when I transliterate, I like to use J. So for, for our purposes here, the, the J grapheme and the W uh, representing the I or E or Y sound, right? And we can see examples here in hui and he, meaning to beat, strike, smite, clap, thresh, repress, right? And so you can see right there. And then, and, and of course, who, soldier, combatant, beater, herdsman. And then we can see the interchange here in these two words for flood. He, meaning flood, and then hu, or hua, hua meaning flood. So uh, again, these are the graphemes, these two reed leaves 
and so when there's two of them together, we usually write it as a Y. Uh, but it's 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 fundamental, or or sometimes you see people put two I's instead of Y, right? But Y I W, they're all interchange, right? And <laughs> so as we you know learn from our discussion on the etymology of Yahweh. Yahweh, my argument is a is, is originates in Egypt as the god Seth, but in his form Yahweh or Yahweh or Yehi, right? But we're not arguing, we're not having that discussion at the moment. What I want to point out here is that if we reconstruct, we know that it was a KM, like the word Kim. That was the origin of these words, and that the K became this Chim and or Shim. And these sounds became these variations the dotted HM, the underlined HM, and the regular HM. And that because the W the, the W often comes from M, the dotted HM becomes the dotted HW. And the uh, regular HM becomes regular HW. And so you can see, you know, um, how this happens here, uh, become the, the, the name of Seth, uh, right? And so, you know, we have this Yahi to darken the skies and then Yahi a name of Seth, Apophis. And this is where I argue that we get the word Yahweh from. Again, that's a different discussion, but notice again uh, this this who meaning to blow, to impact, injury, right? And also who it yet a flood of the now rain. Um, and so these all of these are variations of the same fundamental root having to deal with destruction and heat and the like, right? For the most part. So, you know, we have this him meaning to demolish buildings, attack an enemy. And from that idea of attack an enemy, you also have its variant back here, the dotted HMI, uh, to drive back to repel, right? And then it is a, a variant of HM, smash, break, shatter, and then Hamez to slay to mutilate. And then him warm, dry, hot, and him to burn, to be hot, hoot, flame. So you see how the M intervocally. So this is when we know it's an allophone. So this M, so this this lets us know that there is a vowel after the W and um, the T. Either there's a vowel after the W or there's a vowel before the T. But either way it goes, this H vowel w i mean m, this h vowel m vowel when when suffixed by this t this m becomes w and this is how we get flame fire from this instrument uh suffix t and the m turns into w intervocally it weakens right and so when when you kind of understand these different things uh and how all of these things are related it, there's, you know, you come to understand that the ancient Egyptian really don't have that many words, but they're able to articulate a wide range of, of things because of the agglutative nature of the language, the building of words from these consonant vowel monosyllabic roots. And, and because sounds do not exist unto themselves once you put them in a word and you have prefixes and suffixes they now are in a particular type of articulatory environment and and it is those prefixes and suffixes and agglutinations that force sounds to change right and so this is how you get all of these different variations you know from this common root kin which is goon in the Yoruba language, right? So, 
so we have here like Egyptian internal correspondences, him demolish buildings to harm, to debar from, exclude, to attack. Um, it's supposed to be attack in the enemy, right? And then we have the dotted HM, smash, break, shatter, crush. And then we have him, wild of animals. And then we have it, an animal, him it, a fish, him it, a cow. So these are wild animals, right? And then him, warm, dry, hot, and then him to burn, to be hot. So you can see that these are variations of these common roots that ultimately derive from a KM sound. So when we when we look at Seth, so this is the book Seth, God of Confusion by Herman T. Veld, who you can see over here on the left hand side. Now, <clears throat> so we, we notice this word E. So these so uh, so again, Seth is the God of Confusion. Of, of conflict right and these are all words used to describe the nature of seth in various ancient egyptian texts so you know we have this word it which means illness and then we're going to go down further here to this him himet war shout right and then we have this karyet, illness. And then in him to suffer, right? I'm trying to point out the words that are going to become very important in our uh, discussion. So we see this ne, ne is a shortened version of nehem, him, meaning to roar, a, a loud roaring sound, right? So... Uh, the author states on page 118, on the mythological level, Seth is a disturber of the peace. On the cosmic level, a thunder god, and on the geographical level, a foreigner. In principle, therefore, he can be venerated in borderlands everywhere. It depends on upon historical circumstance and how far this principle is actualized and what evidence is uh, preserved of it, right? And so... Uh, it goes on to say on Ramesses III is said that he is like Seth, the chosen of Ra. His roaring is heard like that of an, uh, uh, it's a cat, cat. Uh, the God Seth himself is known to be capable of loud roaring. I do not know of any representation showing a wingless Seth animal drawing the chariot as da da da. So we're dealing with roaring. So some of these slides is from my uh, conversation on on Yahweh and, and how Seth relates to Yahweh. So this is this aspect of the conversation is dealing with him as a, a storm god and the relationship to roaring and loud thunder. But the the main characteristics of Seth is uh, his aggressive behavior, weather disturbances, and uproariness, right? And so we're going to keep that in mind. We're going to kind of pin the characteristics of Seth and the, and the names and the things that are associated uh, with him and, and how all of these terms, uh, you know, relate to each other in, in regards to, you know, his name and the like. So, so now we're going to deal with segment in West Africa. So, you know, the uh, Kapochichi's, you know, argument is that segment was was borrowed among the proto Bay uh, speakers in uh, Benin and in that Gabon area and Ghana, you know, a few like when we're talking about the Ga uh, folks in Ghana and the like, and even amongst uh, the Yoruba who are Kwa and not Bay, uh, according to the Africanist categorization system. So uh, it's just a random map. So we're, we're talking about this area here where you see the circling mouse icon. You know, this this area is where we're we're concentrated. And <laughs> so uh, Sekhmet is known in West Africa where she is known as Sakpata among the Fauna of Dahomey, Shikpon among the Ga, and Shokpono among uh, the Yoruba in terms of the god of smallpox and disease. Shokpono is in a rune male, a sacred beings in the earth, for which rune also means to be sacred. 
Arun disease, which is related to Arun, anything very hot, or Erun, the dry season. So remember when I talked about disease having to deal with heat, right? And, you know, uh, this is a variation. So I have, why do I have the R and the N highlighted and bolded and read in these words? Because these are dialectical variations of the root that gives us Sekhmet. So Sekhmet was borrowed into West Africa in the form of Sakpata, Shopono, and Shikpon, right? Among the, the these respective languages. But in the Egypt, excuse me, in the Yoruba language, for example, they already have two native variants of the word itself. So we have one borrowing and then we have two native roots. So we're going to discover that Ogun is the, the cognate and the representative of the same for the most part in um, the, the among the Yoruba and that the, that the word also has a, a doublet or dialectical variation in this rn consonant sequence and so you know here are some icons of of, of the deity and so sakpata among the dafan and the homi on the right hand side and on the left hand side shokpono or sokpono uh, among the yoruba and i know i'm not saying it correctly uh because of the tone marks and sokpono now I, I don't know how that's actually pronounced but you know any Yoruba speakers can uh help me out uh, here but these are these two icons so we see these kind of spots on them you know representing the, uh, the smallpox uh on the skin right and so uh the linguist and theologian Dr. Modupe Odioye who we've had on the program uh, he wrote an article in this text here, African Origin of the Major World Religions, edited by Amin Saba Sakana, who we also had on this show, uh, talks about the Shokpono in, and the relationship to Sekhmet and, and how it was a borrowing. So he, so he is the first one, to my knowledge, to... Uh, make that connection between Sekhmet and Sokpono and Shakpata and all of them and, and argues that it was a borrowing. Uh, but what he didn't know is that the, the Sekhmet was cognate with Ogun and Irun in the word Irun Male. So he says on page 87, Shokpono is a disease. It is in the Yoruba an Arun disease. Yoruba Arun shares the same root as Yoruba Irun, sacred beings in Irun Male, sacred beings in the earth. The Rune is, uh, is a reflex of the Afroasiatic root Harum, from which Arabic derived the verb Haruma, to be sacred. From the same root is derived the Hebrew noun Harem, total destruction the type that is required in a holy war. See Yoruba Rune to destroy totally. Arun destroys as effectively as Harem. So when you, when you have a Harem, like you, you heard the, the word a Harem, like when a king has a Harem of women, the Harem is a, a hidden sacred place in a, a king's or a person of note's home where the women are 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 kept at bay from from male guests and the like right and it all comes from this word meaning um sacred to be sacred so you know the woman that is, anything that is kept sacred is kept hidden and so that's that's what a harem is it's it's not just the fact that they have many wives or concubines it's an area of the house where these concubines and and wives are kept because you know you don't you don't want them interacting with the male guests that that come into the space so this information is going to be important because 
if you're doing historical comparative linguistics, you know, you the first thing that you want to do is to set up the sound meaning correspondences between two or more languages so that you can see if anything is inherited or not or borrowed or chance coincidence. And so when Capo Chichi makes the argument that Sekhmet is a borrowing from uh, from this uh, from Semitic, but does no comparative studies to prove that is is very problematic. And for those of you who have who don't have a linguistics background, and especially in historical comparative linguistics, and all you do is rely on the experts, quote unquote, because he has a PhD in linguistics, you'll take his word for it. And so the the real cognate in Semitic for the forms like Sekhmet is Harum, Haruma. And, and, and uh, the, the dotted H or HRM consonant sequence, and we'll see why in, in a moment. And so, again, I spoke about this in Aluja Volume 2, I believe, Chapter 10. So this is, this is me typing right here. So I say, we are reintroduced to our Yoruba word, Arun disease, which is related to Arun, anything very hot, Erun, the dry season. Based on our established sound correspondences, we know that Yoruba RN is a dialectical variant of HM. Given that Shokpono is associated with dust, it is no surprise to find in Chikam Himu dust. It is also associated, and this is the source here, it is also associated with the earth, Shikpon, which is verified by Sahim, cult figure, likeness of God of Earth. And given that Shokpono is one of the Irun Male, sacred beings in the earth, for which the RN or the Rum also means to be sacred, it's not a coincidence that we find in Chikam, Chimu, sacred images, sacred beings. Again, here are the sources. Thus, when Sekhmet traveled to West Africa, all of these associations followed her and confirms these associations in ancient Kemet, the relationship to disease, smallpox, bubonic plague, et cetera, et cetera. So now let's let's get into this. So when, when I say that the the room aspect is is cognate with the the him in ancient Egyptian, I demonstrate. I don't just say I don't hypothesize. I demonstrate here. So I have the, the relevant consonants in sequence and their mappings in bolded and in red for you to see. So him destruction, whom to consume, to extirpate, destroy, annihilate, exterminate, extinct in Yoruba, right? Hum, stomp, or similar. Irin, walk, step, to tread. Him, hot. Irin, anything very hot. Him, pulverized ingredient in incense. Room, to break into pieces or chips, to masticate. Erum, crumbs. Right? Him to be dry as dust or dust. Erun, the dry season. Chemet, to plan, to intend, thinker. Ronu, think, meditate, to be sorry, to be pensive. Chemut, sacred images, sacred beings. Erun, sacred beings. Chem, a relic. Chemu, sacred images. Aworan, image. Right? When you can do this, this is what establishes, this lets us know that the him in Sahmet was not borrowed from Semitic. Because the root of the word is cognate with all of these forms. I can demonstrate all of these forms in the Yoruba language. So Yoruba and ancient Egyptian inherited these forms. So who was Ogun? In the text, Africa's Ogun, Old World Anew, the second edition, Barnes or Sandra T. Barnes informs us that Ogun represents war, violence, and destruction. The same characteristics that we have of Sekhmet which we read at the beginning of our conversation, who was a warrior goddess, 
as well as dealt with uh, disease and plagues and was also a healer, right? As, and as Barnes 1907 notes concerning Ogun, there are two aspects to Ogun. As a violent warrior, just like Sekhmet, fully armed and laden with frightening charms and medicines to kill his foes, and as a leader, or two, and uh, as a leader known for his sexual prowess, who nurtures, protects, and relentlessly pursues truth, equity, and justice, right? And this is exactly what Sekhmet was doing in the in the text uh, on um, that we that we read earlier, uh, where where she came down and enacted justice for Ra, for for man's uh, disobedience, and you know for their kind of carelessness and the like, right? He she was the tool of justice for Ra. And so, among the Yoruba, uh, Odeoye in his text, Words and Meaning in Yoruba Religion, informs us that we should uh, study the Yoruba myth of Ogun as the record of the varied philosophizing of the Yoruba on the, the fantastic phenomenon of what? Wildfire put to use of men for heating and for lighting, for cooking, for hunting, and for war, and for metallurgical factory work, and metal crafts, stage by stage from the first steps in fire lightning to the era of firearms. And he discusses in the book how Ogun comes from a root meaning fire. Just like with him comes from a root meaning fire. And that's how she gets her destructive power, her destructive capabilities, because of the semantic evolution of the word for fire to inflame and then consume to destroy. And it's no different with Ogun. And so this is how Ogun became associated with metallurgy as well, because of the forging process and, of course, the fire and the products the the that which was forged in the fire becomes the goon metal objects so this is why we have in egyptian gin copper objects genu metal pots or vases ogun right and then in yoruba we have ogun orisha of blacksmiths in the fawn language goon bundun the blacksmiths the jabba the ham jabba kuno the evil spirit who built the iron furnaces in the hasa language we have makiri blacksmith Fawn again, Gan, this is their native language of iron. Arabic, Kayun, Smith. And in the Hebrew language, Kain, which is which became Cain in the Bible. Right? So when you're talking about Cain, Cain is Sekhmet, which is why Cain <laughs> killed his brother, because he's a destructive force in nature. And so what the Bible tends to do is to take old gods and demythalize them while technically creating a myth, right? And so it becomes Cain in this instance. And there's a story of Ogun, you know, as a, a, uh, as a volcano, right? And uh, he's a personification of a volcano. And uh, so this is one story which is cited by Oduyoye in his 1984 text. Uh, that's the one on, uh, what is that text? The, uh, ah, it's uh, some of gods and men. Uh, and I don't have it on me right now to remember uh, what the 1984 text was. But anyway, so on the day Ogun was coming from the top of the mountain, it was with fire he covered himself. It was coals of blood that he wore. So they're talking about the lava that came down and destroyed, um, of course, villages and the like. But, you know, this is one of the stories talking about his origin in fire. All right. And in Alluge Volume 2, I cite the I state the following. On top of the mountain, they posited a town of fire, uh, symbolically called Ire. 
and compare Yoruba Aro fire pot Arabic Ara Ahara to burn Hebrew ear heat in a far er, and er and bother your set on fire. And and I also have uh which I should have included in the document Middle Egyptian Yerit flame, right? Other myths state directly this fact, stating that he came to the world from a volcano as it was erupting and brought with him the ability to forge weapons and tools. Uh, Turner and Coulter, 2001, page 360, uh, for that expanded story. And because remember, I discussed this all of what we're talking about for the most part in Illusion Volume 2. And so you can you can see how the the early forges were considered like miniature volcanoes right where they refer you know the you can see the blacksmiths uh, and look at the size of this furnace on the right hand side compared to the to the brothers uh sitting down there so they're 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 getting the fire right and this and here's a kind of a miniature kin uh kiln uh in ancient kemet and some people look at this and think that this is the kim glyph uh, which it is not. And but, you know, some early, at least one early uh, Egyptologist believes so. And this is how we get the entry in the Ermin and Grandpa Wartabush, uh, Wartabush Dictionary, uh, meaning Kim, um, meaning a Kim or, or to burn uh, uh, coal or something like that, to burn charcoal or something like that. And then Kim. Uh, but that's a mistake, and you can tell by the flames here. They don't even, they don't even operate and go in the same direction, uh, and that becomes important. And I discuss this in the upcoming text on the etymology of the word Kemet. But let's continue. So <clears throat> this this becomes important into uh, some other aspect of the conversation in terms of the relation of Ogun and and him, right? And so remember that the him, the h sound correlates to the dotted H and the M sound internally in Egyptian also correlates to the W sound. And so many people don't, you know, know this second name of the Sphinx. So many of you may be familiar with this variant the Haru M. Achet. And, and you may have heard the Greek variation, Harmachis, the great Sphinx of Giza as a god, right? And so here is a picture of the Haru M. Achet, or Achet, right? Or Heru on the horizon is the definition. But there's another variation of this word, Hu, meaning Sphinx. And this is, oh, Hawa, Hawa, we don't know how it's actually pronounced. But we just conveniently say who. Uh, but this should be spelled like Ogun. We can we'll, we'll substitute this with Ogun, right? Uh, for the Sphinx. And so this this word here can mean the hitter, um, and it's just also a divine sacred being, right? And so, you know, I have to of course prove everything that i'm saying so i just can't just tell y'all stuff and and then not prove it so in the yoruba language there is kind of a what we call semantics slippage or uh kind of uh semantic nuance with the changing of certain home organic sounds in the language so in this first column here we have the g n consonant sequence in the second column we have the k n consonant sequence both of them in the yoruba language and so we have in in this first column ogun god of iron war and hunting the the semantic uh the semantic variation uh is is made with a k sound so i can bravery brave valor Okun, strength, Akuni, brave person, a hero with the agentive uh, uh, prefix there, the ah, right? And so in Chikam, 
we have this variant mehu hunter fish spear um and and some of y'all who have my work know that this mh this m dotted h uh is the syllabic inverse of the dotted hm right and for some reason there uh there's just two variations of these words uh and, and themes in ancient egyptian you know many with m dot h and then h dot m in a reverse so we would say that this is the quaki variant and this is the kikwe variant uh read eluja volume two to understand what i'm talking about and then so we have notice that we have three columns here right excuse me yeah three columns of yoruba so we have one column with the gn sequence we have the second column with the kn sequence and then we have this fourth column but which is our third yoruba column with the rn sequence right and so we have room to consume expire extarpate destroy annihilate exterminate extent irunu indignation anger emotion wrath rage right all these different various semantic variations built off of the same thing then we have ogun god of iron war and hunting and you could just say goon in in terms of blacksmith um right and then we have himet copper and craftsman and remember that this this variant is kemet a metal instrument and then we have in yoruba irin iron nail metal and then we have ogun 20 and hasa is gamma and then we have kun fool to be fool and and the reason why this is these are connected because 20 is is the uh is the is the general meaning but the secondary meaning is fullness to be complete because it, it represents five excuse me 10 toes and 10 fingers so it's a complete set when we talk about 20 when they're in their counting because uh the the counting system is based off of hands counting hands and feet the the fingers on hands and feet right and so we have in egyptian meh to be full to fill and then its inverse is the word kim which also can mean uh to be full uh and to be complete and then we have this the rn variant which is reduplicated ron ron entirely totally all together again complete fullness same semantic uh area here and so you know uh when it comes to the uh the sphinx it becomes important because heru there there was a group called the shimsu heru and not just the research team that's miwu jawu and sunjeti but there wasn't this is where we got the name from the followers of heru they were they were metallurgists blacksmiths who came from the south and you can read about the shimsu heru uh, or the followers of Horus being metallurgists and you know a couple of uh, Budge's works and there's, there's a lot of literature on it but uh, I want to continue these correlations here so what, what I want y'all to be able to connect is that the GN sequence connects to in the Yoruba also connects to KN sequence in Yoruba but also dotted HM in Egyptian as well as RN in Yoruba right so just how we saw those different like if I go back here and I show you like all the different variations of the same word that came from uh the common root here this the same thing happened in Yoruba right so that's why we're seeing these three columns so we already proved that the 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 uh the h with the loop under it m corresponds to rn in the yoruba but notice that because we remember we already connected this type of uh uh m in in sequence to the other dotted hm and a regular hm which we'll show some more in a little bit later.
So, you know, here we can see, for example, gone, gone, uprightly, straightly, exactly, is corresponds to Egyptian, um, but and truly, which is an enclitic particle. But when it talks about true, is that which be which is uh, straight, which is right and exact. And and so here's the other variant in the Yoruba language, room to be straight or to be direct. And so these words, as they evolved, begin to be narrowed and serve a particular purpose. So notice that this Hemet, a servant or a slave, notice this, this T uh, agent suffix here, right? A servant or slave derives from, uh, excuse me, has a correspondence in the Yoruba ran, help, aid in business. Areni, one who comforts or consoles, you know, because it's someone who was of service. And and so this is this root, root here is to help or to aid in business, someone who's a servant, right? But of course, in the addiction, uh, in a lot of dictionaries, they just assume that anyone who is a servant or a worker somehow is a slave. Uh, but anyway, so goon, like an ogun to pound, gone, gone, drum or war drum. So we can see how the, the reduplication of the GN root nominalizes it. So it becomes from this root meaning to pound and the changing of the vowel, it becomes a word for drum. And then we have this word, khan, to hammer, kuna, to be powder, to be smooth, that which was grinded, that which was hammered. So we have in Egyptian, khamer, to tread, to press out. And then Khmer to hammer out to create, and then room to break into pieces or chips. And this is uh, this last column here is very interesting. So we have Olo Guinea, right? Meaning cat. The root is the Guinea. So you'll find a lot of words with this Olu, you know, he who is the owner of, or he who is that uh, Guinea, a cat, right? But then we have Eku, tiger, in the cat family, of course. And it's also the same word for leopard. And then Kinun, lion, cat family. But then we have this word chemet. It just says it's just defined in the dictionaries as an animal. But look at the uh the determinative for the word. It is of a cat, right? But then we have this variant, Iran, meat, flesh, beast, animals, Iran, elephant, Iran, me, hippopotamus, well. And so the underlying, which we'll see in a moment, is really just a wild animal. But you can see in, in, in at least these three variants here, there's a specific association with, with uh, the, the wild beasts of the cat family. And so when we're talking about him and an animal uh, and we go back to the Sphinx, what do we see here and who? Remember that dotted HM corresponds to dotted HW. And so when we see in the in the glyph here the lying laying down, like this becomes very important, right? So this is why we can associate it with Ogun or Ogini, Ologini, in this sense. But so, like, uh, so we so we hit on this last row, and so now. We, we're here, we're just doing some more. So I just wanted to show in this one the, the proof that the dotted HM also corresponds to dotted HN as in Nancy, but also this underlying, the, the H with the underline here, as well as just regular H. And there's actually more examples of the H underline, but, uh, but you can see this for yourself. So him to tread, and then the, the M drops in this reduplication here to go to tread, heb, heb, M and B correspond in Egyptian to tread, to traverse, and then irin to walk, to step. So hemet, uterus, womb, henu, the interior, the inside, which ancient Egypt was actually known for one time. So one could one could make an argument, come to the center, come to the to the womb come home come to the to the motherland you know some more investigation is needed there but then out in middle center medium mean right so we have him him a jug for milk and wine hen a protective container a coffin box in this variant the hindu jar chattel the hindu box cavity 
da da da. Then we have Hinet, the or Hinet, the waterway in the heavens. Hinet, a pool, lake. Hen, 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 yet waters. It rain, moisture, soaking. So you can see these these sound changes and these variants in the language. So you know, again, it's it's not a coincidence that when we're talking about Sekhmet, that as I told you before, why she has a lioness head, right? And this is supposed to be a lion. This looks kind of like a frog, but I've never seen a green lion. But, you know, um, I haven't seen a primary where she looks green like that, or at least I just can't recall off the top of my head. But this is a lion's head that you see here on the right hand side of Sekhmet. So again, it is not coincidence that she has a lion's head because of the the similar association with uh these terms right and so when we look at the harem ocket again we notice uh these there's there's a play on words here so we have the who which is this you know that's just defined as sphinx in the dictionaries but we also have the hiwi to strike to drive Remember, I said to note down the word to drive or to to expel, to repel. That's what this is here. Right. And you can see the person with the stick ready to uh, to 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 hit someone, to be violent towards. But we also have this word nechem, to seize in late Egyptian. So notice these other words that I have at the bottom, as well as their hieroglyphs on the left on the left so we have this word ram meaning caesar and it says horus as a lion at edfu the king and these are the sources at the end of the words here ram caesar horus as a lion at edfu the king but notice here chemat or chemet to seize or seize grasp penetrate collect of people to drive off Chematsi, to seize, to grasp. But this word here, meaning to drive off, is the same here as meaning to strike or to drive and hui. And that's what the, the Sphinx does. You know, it's like a guard for the pyramids. Right? And because a, a lion is, is, is the way that they kind of, they, uh, they, they snatch their food, you know, it was it was something in in the minds that they felt that they had to record. So that's why they have, you know, Horus always associated with not also the falcon, but with the lions, the cats, the ogun, the ologinis, the ekuns, as we would call them, call ekun. So. <clears throat> And Amon Ra Ra said, yes, the, the text was the sons of gods and the daughters of men, an Afro-Asiatic interpretation of Genesis. Right? And so thank you uh, to Amon Ma'at Ra. So I couldn't remember the name of the text uh, earlier. So I appreciate it. So you, you see how all this is coming together? So that's why you have to understand what paronymy is. It is a word linked to another by similarity of form. That is to say, the common usage of words which are almost homonyms but have slight differences in spelling and have different meanings in words having a similar sound but different orthography and different meanings like the English word all and all, right? These are two different words, but they sound alike. So when when you see Sekhmet here with with uh, her two who to, her two main features, actually three main features, because the snake and the the sun and the fire represent the fire, and her uh, and and her face and the lion, you know, all have words that uh, sound alike in the language, and because of the their similarity in pronunciation and things over time. 
they merge them and this is how you get the iconography right and so you know the the yoruba goon is equivalent to these egyptian terms uh that you will see coming from here and some i didn't even go into just for the sake of time but you know again these are different forms so the another form of ogun in the ancient egyptian language is actually seth but the other ogun is sekhmet because the gn and ogun corresponds to the hm the dotted hm and the chim and so that's why you got to know um the what do we call it the uh uh transitivity in, in mathematics that if a implies b and b implies c or a equals b and b equals c therefore a equals c and it's the same formula here so the same old goon that corresponds to these rn sequences here also correspond to these uh the lowercase x m uh sequence in our transliteration but him right and they all have the same origins in fire and the same correlations and correspondences in terms of their semantic meaning and it's all different types of words that originate from these forms and so so just like how we have ogun perspiration and ikun moisture and nostrils we have irin moisture a soaking damp rin damp moist humid wet and so just like how we have ogun medicine in the yoruba language and it has to deal with trees trees and medicine we have erun this is why ogun has a certain uh pouch or whatnot uh, full of of medicines and things so remember they're playing on words here because ogun uh medicine is a different word than ogun the deity but as Barnes has stated on page two, Ogun is is noted for two major uh, characteristics. One as a violent warrior, fully armed and laden with frightening charms and medicines to kill his foes. Right. And, and this is how the warrior drives out diseases. They can be the source of disease and be the cure at the same time because of this instance uh this origin meaning to drive out right to drive to drive away to ward off because that's what a warrior does that's what an army does that's what the military does it warns it it wards off danger so the same spirit of warrior that can kill something and destroy something can also be a protective concept and ward off danger and so that's that's the spirit that is being used in terms of the healing in medicine and so that's how we get you know ogun medicine associated with ogun the uh the uh not medicine the uh the deity right and so we have Erun, the name of a tree much used in making charcoal, uh, again, fire, and also as a medicine, both internally and externally. Oru and Orun, name of a tree possessing healing properties, right? And so in that same kind of vein, we have Ogun, perspiration, ekum, moisture in the nostrils. And then we have Chem, water hole. And there's other various, it's like a H, H dotted w uh dealing with water and then notice this this dotted hm verb here a verb associated with curing an illness right but also look at the bottom here we have chemet a kind of treatment medicine and so this is talking about the medical crapper eye that you find there the same commit so this is why sechmet is also is dealing with just like ogun with uh warriorship with diseases but also healing and medicine 
because of the different the different words that sound alike in the language it's called paranimi that's how the culture was created right and so you know these pages here are just uh some more sound correspondences and you know many of these actually i'm not sure if these are well they have to be in um illusion volume two but I'll, I'll probably repeat and expand it in terms of uh, the upcoming text but you can view this on your own and examine the quality of my comparisons but you know notice that the gn in yoruba and the kn in yoruba also corresponds to the the dotted k this is a different sound in the in the egyptian language and the KM and the KN sounds in Chiluba Bantu. So this is how you know that this stuff was not borrowed into the e Egyptian language by the Semites. One, Kapo Chichi got the, the wrong idea of what the root is. And then because he does no comparative work, he just kind of just makes guesses and then argues from his guesses right and so here are some more correspondences uh for you and again these are for you know just pausing the video at a later time and and you can review these you know you should have them already if you have a Luja volume two and here are some more you know, like we can go on for days with these sound meaning correspondences. And that's why you this is one of the reasons why we do the comparative method. So that we can eliminate chance, like all of these correspondences eliminate chance. So the forms that you see in Egyptian and in and in Yoruba and in Chiluba, uh, and uh, for example, these are all inherited terms from the proto language. There's no other explanation for them. So in summary, as we end up end here, I argue that Ogun is cognate with Egyptian Sekhmet. And Sekhmet is an Irun Male, a sacred being of the earth in her form as a disease. But she is a sun deity in the form of the Eye of Ra and Hathor. And the word segment is not a borrowing from Semitic. And this speaks to the importance of the comparative method in doing etymological work. And so this is why you should not be afraid of anyone with a PhD if you know what you're doing and know how to argue and what, what certain arguments imply in the long run right so with that said i will end the presentation and i will look for any questions or comments uh let me see so i have to scroll up so it looked like y'all were just kind of really listening uh ujawu piece of ujawu as Africana, generally those who deal with African languages not using the comparative method, but rather mass comparative grammar method, differing from what is used in Indo-European languages. Exactly. And peace to Brother Mathis and Kafra Amose. Peace and blessings and peace to Richard Sheffield. Thank you for watching. And uh, Robert Rand, always good to have you in the building and simply saved and michael eason uh, says i'm actually understanding all of this good presentation i appreciate it and what does he say i'm following the other pieces here and i'm trying to say you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, uh, i appreciate it thank you yes and you already made that and forex nugget says hola mi gente uh Jahuti says a scribe had bars. <laughs> and Jagad Davis is in the building. Peace and blessings. And Sat12 asks uh, Sarmatep, what is the ancestor of Semitic language? 
Um, it really just depends on what school of thought you adhere to. So understand that my what I'm about to say is a minority opinion, but it is an opinion based on actual work um, that that has been done in comparisons. And so if you are an Africanist, the the parent language to Semitic is what they call Afro-Asiatic. So Semitic is a language family itself. And so they believe in this concept called a language phylum. And so a language phylum is supposed to be uh, a grand super language grouping that includes a number of language families, right? So the for, for an Africanist, Semitic emerges as a result of this hypothetical Afro-Asiatic language uh, phylum and you know descends from there but if we're going through the the negro egyptian model the one from mboli because you got to understand that there's there's a hypothesis that was presented by obinga in 1993 but he didn't work out all of the details he didn't do the constructions he just put forth the notion that there was a grander language family for which all the for the well most of the african languages were related and he called this group negro egyptian but he he separated berber as its own language family as well as khoisan with all the other known african languages he grouped under negro egyptian uh, when mboli came along he looked at the analysis and was like i uh the the evidence is there that there is a uh, a common language family however obinga didn't um he didn't reconstruct negro egyptian he didn't he didn't go through that process in in his 1993 work he just did the preliminary work so um and Boli comes from there uh advances is a little bit more strict on on the 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 languages that were used and in the process and then he reconstructs a a preliminary negro egyptian and he's currently working on a text that deals specifically with the semitic languages as well as indo-european in relationship to negro egyptian so under his model matter of fact i will just show it uh so let me go back and share my screen because i just happen to have this up so from current slides so hopefully y'all see this so this is the uh the model hold on let me uh, take that off so y'all can see so here we go <coughs> excuse me so you know if you have Aluja volume two you know that i renamed his i, I didn't change the structure of his updated model of Negro Egyptian, I just renamed certain aspects of it. So uh, I, I renamed the the larger grouping as Chi and Kanda and broke it down. If you can look on your right hand side, this is a kind of a rough, uh, you know, grouping kind of a, not rough, but a very simplified grouping. So we have Chienkanda Chikulu, which is the oldest branch that you can see here. So Chikulu meaning old, ancient, and the like, and also ancestral, you know. So this is the ancestral language, Chienkanda Chikulu, the branch. And so this, this branch broke off in, excuse me, this source language broke off into three branches called Kikwe, Kweki, and Kikuki. So that's what you see in these rows here. Branch one, branch two, branch three becomes Kikwe, Kweki, and Kikuki. And these are the, the dominant syllabic forms in each language. I won't go into what all that means. And so the, the, the two branches, the uh, Kikwe and Kweki branch, become 
what in 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 Boley's model is negro or, or post classic negro egyptian right but that is what i call i renamed it china into so that's what you see here the china into languages so the china into languages uh breaks off essentially into two uh dialects called the Bere dialect and the Biher dialect and they interact with each other over time and give birth to Proto-Bantu and remember that third branch that Kikuki branch right you see these arrows are pointing these are based on linguistic evidence the interactions between these language groups and the borrowing of words the influence of the language groups on each other and how certain languages have formed from there so this third branch is the kikuki branch which becomes the pre-proto-semitic and this pre-proto-semitic language interacts with the beher languages so the the it's, it's really the interaction between kikuki and beher african languages that give us pre-proto-semitic and from this pre-proto-semitic and their interactions with the proto-bantu languages give us proto-semitic right so this is what you see here uh, kikuki becomes kabed it's a word for liver and bere and beher are words for liver. If you just kind of pay attention to how they are worded, uh, excuse me, how the, the forms are, and it lets you know kind of the difference in terms of the pronunciation. And these are kind of characteristic of the words. And so remember those, those, those tri-consonantal roots that we spoke about in terms of Semitic, it emerges from the Kikuki branch, right? So this is this is a different model. So this is the model that that I follow and there and even without this model there are there are linguists who have published texts talking about how Semitic emerges from a convergence process right and and so that's all what you're saying so when you're talking about those you, you saw those arrows pointing to the different boxes with the different branches or or, or whatnot those long-term interactions and marrying and and either wars and settling whatever the case may be the the long-term interactions between those languages have them converging on features and the like and and, and borrowing of words and things and so certain language groups emerge from that convergence process and so semitic as we know emerges from a a convergence process and there's there's lots of evidence to for that which is why they can't reconstruct past proto-semitic to any other group because there, there's no clear clean line from a proto-language to proto-semitic and then the arabic hebrew akkadian ugaritic you know uh and, and all the other languages right those proto-semitic emerged as different language groups settled in a confluent zone and that's why you can you can see some features for example of egyptian and egyptian words as shared with semitic and this is where the confusion comes from the africanists who don't do the historical comparative method they thinking that egyptian and and Semitic languages are, are are really close when they're not. And so, but that's a whole conversation in of itself. So I, I hope that, I know it doesn't fully answer the question, but I hope it gives you some, some kind of semblance of the, the complexity of the question that you asked. So uh, in appreciation to uh, Musoni for joining the conversation, and Raswan says, would you say that devotees of Ogun are actually de facto devotees of Sekhmet? Uh, no. And, and, and this is why I say, um, 
because they wouldn't have necessarily any idea of of, of segment and and so we got to remember that names of deities are just names of words in the language so it would be no different if i if i'm creating a religion amongst african americans and and i make a deity called book right and and let's just say that you know musoni here right wherever he's at decides to start a religion and we speak a a common uh, excuse me we speak a related language and 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 they have a word we're just going to make up a word so let's just say that they have a word uh that is cognate with our word book but they pronounce it like uh fook right or fungu right and they decide that you know the the idea of of reading books is important and we need to pass this value on to future generations so what we're going to do is deify the fook or fung right and so while the the uh the cult members and and followers of book in uh, amongst my group you know would have some kind of common similarities in things with uh brother musoni's group i couldn't say that they're necessarily de facto worshipers of you know fook uh hold on i'm gonna have to pause that real quick uh that's brother taki on the phone uh shout out to him and I wonder if they're back because, uh, you know, um, I thought he, they were in Egypt and uh, for a second tour, you know, for the year. So shout out to those who are on the Hoppy tour currently right now in Egypt. So but anyway, so I hope that answers the question in a uh, fundamental way. Uh, it's the first time today that I hear the word Mulungu being used to the devil as opposed to God, what could be the reason the same word for both the devil and God? Well, you got to understand it, it's, it's, partic it's particular languages um, in, in Eastern parts. And so that, that word Mulungu and Mulungu, it's, there's homonyms throughout the Bantu languages. So it's, it's you could be used to Mulungu as you know like a god and a deity but it's just a as defined and let me go back to that slide so you can kind of understand the context of what is being stated here and so let me uh here we go from this current slide so you know in the text she's talking about folks in tanzania uh, first and foremost. And so the reconstructing of the proto Kaskazi, uh, this particular Lungu is potentially an evil spirit type associated with hot areas. So it, it's the spirit of, of heat, fire, and disease. Because, uh, I don't know if you were there for this part of the conversation where I talked about how in many African languages, the, the concept of of heat and disease are connected so when when you're talking about pain when you're talking about discomfort when you're talking about disease pestilence usually words that diachronically are words for fire and heat become the words for those uh for disease uh in general and so in in these cases this is malungu these aren't necessarily mulungu um and then, of course, in these instances here, in terms of Mulungu, devil, and the like, remember that these are are these are in terms for kind of lesser spirits that are associated with hot and poisonous things. So they they have a a negative connotation. And with the coming of Christianity and or Islam, depending upon the area now it has taken a shift 
to to devil in in some of these but then again you got to remember that europeans are writing the the dictionaries so this may not accurately be what is being um defined you know but again i'm just quoting directly the source and so it's from uh nurse and hindbush you know swahili and sabaki uh the text uh, is shrown or uh, shrown room the historical reconstruction of great lakes bantu cultural vocabulary i actually have this text uh here and uh, i wish i would have had it on me you know so i can examine you know his thing so like when when we talk about the the arun so in the Irun, the so uh, like uh, Sopono is a disease. It is in Yoruba and Arun, a disease. Yoruba Arun shares the same root as Yoruba Irun, the sacred beings. But that that Rn root also comes from this Arin. You see this? Anything very hot, right? Which is also cognate with him, hot in, in ancient Egyptian so so ultimately that's where it is coming from but you know i'm not sure that they would necessarily call it the devil but you know it is what it is uh let me see <laughs> he says look and by the way south africa and azania the word mulungu is used to refer to the white man <laughs> and and uh, who was it elijah muhammad the white man is the devil uh so he said has emboli's model been scientifically scrutinized through peer review by other linguists in the field is it recognized and accepted um that depends there are there are other linguists who have reviewed it and have accepted it and there are others who haven't reviewed it and haven't accepted it and there are a few who have reviewed it like for example capo chichi is one who uh hasn't accepted it but this this would be expected for the simple fact that capo chichi is an africanist and he adheres to the greenberg method and emboli is very critical of greenberg and anyone who uses that methodology the same as uh theophilo bingo the same as check Auntie joe you know who who are are very critical and shun the greenbergian mass comparative method and so but understand this as well the greenberg method isn't scientifically accepted by linguists around the world it's rejected and so with emboli's work being a pioneering work it's going to take time for people to to catch on you know and so in in america there wasn't there wasn't many people who even knew about emboli's work until i presented it online way back in 2013 or 2014. All right his book came out in 2010 2011. so the the backlash that emboli is getting from negro peons on the end on the YouTube space, one, they don't understand and can't read the French. Two, they don't understand historical comparative linguistics. And three, they never read the text. And so they come up with all these other kinds of crazy nonsense on, on reasons to reject it. And they don't even understand the work. And then you have people like Capo Chichi, who has a degree in linguistics, but it's not historical comparative linguistics. You know, his PhD dissertation had to deal with morph, uh, morphosyntax of Benin languages. A living, a, it's a synchronic degree. It's not he does not do any reconstructions whatsoever based on uh, any kind kind of comparative method. There's no text where you can see in in Capo Chichi's work where he's doing comparative historical comparative linguistic work. It just doesn't exist. And so, you know, this is why it's important for people to to understand the history of a discipline. It's not enough to just try to jump into arguments because and I'm not saying that you are. This is just in the spirit of, of recent conversations It's not enough to just come into an argument and, and debate and think that, you know, something 
and you don't know the history of the field itself. You know, like I, I have these discussions with Dr. Uh, Shermarker Keita a lot. And when we first met way back in 2010 or 2011, um, you know, at the, uh, it was a conference in Atlanta. And, and, you know, he was sitting there and instructed me and he was telling me like, in terms of your research methods, it's always good to just research the, the history of the field itself so that you can learn how the research methods in the field developed over time. And more importantly, what are the schools of thought in these fields? And when you're, when you're just, see, people don't understand when they're just Googling, because they do a lot of Google shift in, on YouTube, when they're Googling and they're just grabbing information, they have no idea, you know, what school of thought you know, this particular person belongs to. And all of that is important so that you can you can know the 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 history of arguments and the rebuttals that have been uh, given throughout the years. And that's what a lot of these folks don't have. So they don't they don't they don't know where to go when 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 certain arguments are presented to them because they don't know the history. They've never and they never worked and actually done the work in the field. And 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 have been able to be able to look at it and say, ah, I see why, you know, so and so said this, and I see why so and so said this, because when I come back and I do the work, I see these particular outcomes, and that's what I had to learn and do over the years. And it's not something that you can microwave. It's not something that you're going to learn in a weekend. It's not something you're going to even learn in a year. You know, it it takes years of studying the field to know this. This is how, for example, because when I first started, when I was taught through, through um, my Africana studies, because remember, I, I, I minored in African studies. And so part of the, the, um, the, the track was to study, you know, of course, history and the rules of history and the history of, uh, of linguistics. And so when Karen Kleiman and Dr. Gonzalez and all of these were teaching me back in the day, they were teaching from the Greenberg perspective. So when, when I jumped into it, you know, I automatically, because that force of that's who's teaching the courses, I jumped into the, the Greenberg school. And so when you see some of my early analysis, it was based on the Greenberg method. So I know it in and out. And then when I started seeing these arguments against it, you know, of course, the first thing is cognitive dissonance. You know, you want to defend you know, everything. And, and this can't be true. But then you start working out and then really kind of reading and comparing and doing things. And then you kind of see like, oh, I see why this doesn't work. And I had to had to switch my whole game up. And so just because something is in in college, just because some people accept a particular argument does not mean it's scientifically justified. And the question that you always have to ask is, are you competent enough to scientifically justify anybody's argument? And, and that's that's fundamentally the, the issue that we have with a lot of folks online. They don't know how to justify anybody's arguments. All they can do is say so and so said this and he got a Ph.D. So and so said this. That's not how scholarship is done. That's not how science is done. Is demonstration. Demonstration beats conversation each and every time. Let me continue. From the Bible view, God and the devil look like two sides of the same coin. For the most part, yes. Says 12 Psalms. Are there modern African languages which can be classified as Kikuki or Kabed? Um, I'm not sure. I would have to ask in bold because it seemed like the Kikuki. Uh, individuals migrated into the Middle East and into Europe. And um, so that's a good question. So I don't know. Again, remember that the, the, the chart that I just showed, that's kind of a preview of a, a work that he is, is working on. So I don't know if he has classified 
a, a language in Africa outside of Arabic, for example, or the, um, the, the, the East African Semitic languages as uh, Kebed. Right. So that's that's just a good question to uh, to ask him. And I'll make sure that I ask him uh, soon. So and you're welcome, good brother. And yes, they rely on experts. You 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 only rely on experts when you don't have uh, competency in the field. Like I have to rely on experts when it comes to quantum quantum physics, like. You know, I understand I'm understanding more because I'm studying it now, you know, just as, you know, for for research for an upcoming text. But I'm, I'm in no I'm in no place to to sit here and argue with Negroes on the Internet about issues in quantum mechanics. I'm just not. That's just not my that's not my forte. So I know my limitations. And so at, on, on that, all I can do is 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 lean on on experts but if it gets to a point where you know we have experts who are all equally qualified and have the same degrees and same amount of publications and they're arguing two uh sides or, or two opposing you know arguments at that point if i'm truly interested i'm going to have to step in and do my own studies and and do the work myself and to see whose who's, who's argument is, is closest to the truth. And that's what I've done with linguistics. That's what I've done in Africana studies in terms of uh, ancient Egyptian and the like. And he says, do you know where the Khoisan and Pygmy languages fall into that chart? The, the so-called Pygmy languages are Bantu languages. Uh, the, the argument is that they want spoken language in uh or or languages that belong to an unknown family and as a result of the quote unquote bantu migrations they either were forced or they adopted on their own the bantu languages so they speak bantu languages uh however the so-called khoisan khoisan is not even really a group but um the to my knowledge the the languages that are classified as Khoisan do not fit into the uh the negro egyptian model either by emboli or uh theophilo Binga. so theophilo Binga has it as a as a as a separate group uh but i don't i don't think um but i would have to see see See, one thing about this is that, again, demonstration beats conversation. So, you know, I don't know if, see, what, what has to happen is somebody who understands historical comparative linguistics and the comparative method and has read and, and went through and, and verified the procedure and stuff by Emboli, but is also competent and, and knowledgeable in the phonology the morphology and everything and the basic vocabulary of the you know one or more of the so-called khoisan languages they would have to do that work so that would require like for emboli he would have to you know kind of learn about the these uh, uh so-called khoisan languages in a in depth in the way that he's done these other languages and that's you know that's not what we want to do we want we want to have somebody else jump in who has knowledge on those languages to do that kind of work with the languages um uh, that uh emboli and others you know within the school of thought have compared and to see where they fall and because again khoisan khoisan nalo saharan uh, Niger Congo and Afroasiatic were all developed under the same methodology. So, you know, Khoisan is not really even a, a, a genetic grouping, you know. So, you know, who knows? One or more of those languages could be, in fact, you know, a very important and critical part of, of understanding the, the so-called Negro Egyptian. 
Um, hold on, let me. Because, uh, hold on. I'm sorry, even I got a message him. Because uh, I am doing. Am doing a live show. I'm gonna have to show him this so he knows that uh, I'm not playing. And doing a live show. All right, so boom. All right. So I don't know what I was saying, but I hope I said what I said made sense. Uh, so I appreciate it. And Ujawu says, no, nope, people abuse the statement, rely on experts when it's really appeal to authority, logical fallacy. Exactly. So, again, you know, in, in science, you don't rely on experts, you rely on evidence and your ability to understand and, and ability to evaluate the evidence. If you're a lay person, one, you shouldn't be arguing. That's that's the whole point of this. If you're a lay person. And, this, and you don't study the field, you don't have an argument because you don't know enough to argue. And so if your only recall is to appeal to um, authority or rely on experts, which is an appeal to authority, logical fallacy, then you have no business arguing. You you just really should be quiet. So those who are actually in it and and, and have demonstrated and can put to put together arguments in the field are the only ones that should be having the conversation, and and that's what a lot of a lot of people don't understand, and so, and so we're going to get back into so I'm going to do another show maybe this Sunday, if if I have time this Sunday, seeing how my schedule is, I may do a show on just what is linguistics, and and who's involved in linguistic work because you know you have a lot of again internet Negroes who are confused on uh, what, what this is when we talk about language studies. But um, it doesn't look like there are any more questions or comments. So it's already been going on three hours now. So I am going to end this discussion as you know we are far over time but i do appreciate each and every one of you for joining this conversation and again i'm gonna come back and divide the the video so when you're replaying you can just kind of jump to the important parts so with that said love and light and i will see you hopefully this weekend peace <laughs>